Yeah, yeah, it's Travis and Michael Cena right behind Duggan when he rolled the star over. That's what he saw. That's what Greg and Michael and Mr. Bryan saw. So then you got to think to yourself, okay, what's going on in their heads? There's a dead man in the street. Travis McMichael has just shot him. Okay? The police are on the scene. There's now a video of it. So are there statements a couple hours later? Self-serving? You decide. Do you guys do their investigation starting on May 5th, 2020, followed by the arrest? So first off, the credibility of witnesses. That's for you to determine who you believe and who you don't believe. Okay, so what does that mean is you're the one who decides whether Travis McMichael is telling you the truth or lying to you. Right? So let's talk about some of the defense witnesses. Annabelle Beasley. What did she do when she got off the stand? She walked over here and waved at them as she walked off the stand. I mean, I know you all saw that, right? Okay. So Annabelle Beasley, Team McMichael. Subi Lawrence. Who is she? Boy, Team McMichael. Even after this, I mean, after the shooting, she and Brooke Press and Diego Press, they're going out in the boat with Greg and Lee McMichael. They're still hanging out with them. Okay, Team McMichael. Brooke Press, Team McMichael. Up until February 11th. And then what did she tell you? Her husband, Diego Press, had had it with this. Had had it with Larry English, not calling the police. Had had it with helping out Larry English. He wasn't going to do it anymore because this was not cool. Why was it not cool? Because Diego Perez went inside that house with his flashlight, and Greg McMichael came up and went in the house. What was Brooke doing? My husband's in there. My husband's in there. All right. Well, Greg McMichael had his gun. Travis McMichael told you that. He had his gun. Diego had his gun. Brooke had her gun. You know, everybody had a gun. Everybody in this case had a gun, except Maud Arbery. And so, what almost happened? I mean, come on, let's get real. It's a miracle Diego Perez and Greg McMichael didn't kill each other inside that house, right? Pulling guns out. And that was it. What did Brooke tell you? No more. Not doing this anymore. You determine the credibility of those witnesses. Now, when you consider Travis McMichael and his testimony, there's some things you want to look at. And the judge is going to tell you, these are things you consider. The manner of testifying. Evidence of bias for or against the party. Does he have bias for or against Greg and Michael? Is he bad? Okay. Motive in testifying. Yeah. He wants you to come back to the not guilty verdict. It's in his best interest. Think about the probability or improbability of their testimony. I wondered why he was attacking that truck. Just in case you didn't know what channel you was watching, welcome back to 420 Team Loud TV. I mean, do you guys understand what he was getting at? I mean, I guess we're back to Maude Arbery's a carjacker. Their interest or lack of interest in the outcome of the case means do they have something to gain or lose by coming in here and making up a story for you? Their personal credibility as you observe it. That's for you to decide. Not for the state to decide, not for the defense to decide, for you to decide. All right, so did Travis and Michael have a motive to lie to you? Do you have a motive to make up additional things that he has never said before? All right. Did he have a motive to embellish his testimony? Did he have a motive to claim he now was confused on February 23rd, 2020? Isn't that convenient? Wow, it was the most traumatic. Yeah, and I don't dispute that it was probably the most traumatic experience of his life. How did Mr. Arbery's day go for him? All right. Most traumatic experience for Travis and Michael. So he's all confused, but did manage to write out a three-page you know, statement and immediately put down. On January 1st, my gun was stolen. But all sorts of contextual details in that statement. Did he have a motive to use talking points? Okay? Well, ladies and gentlemen, did he come up here? How many times did he say totality of the circumstances to you? Did he have his talking points down a year and nine months later? That's for you to decide. He went on the mother said a gun was stolen. The defendant's story. The law allows you to disregard one of the the Michaels. From the witness stand if you don't find it credible. I'm not sure. I don't remember. I think it was the son. The law allows you to consider as the actual real evidence his actions at the time of the murder if you don't find it credible. 
intent to commit a crime. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you got to find that they intended to commit these crimes, and when you, how do you look at that? Well, you look at the, the natural and necessary consequences of the act, right? Natural and necessary consequences of an act. Deadly force is the last resort. Never point a gun at someone you do not intend to shoot. Right. So when you start pointing a shotgun directly at somebody, what's your intention? To shoot them. The natural and necessary consequence of the act. You're going to kill the person. Good point with that. The defendant's not going to be presumed to have acted with criminal intent, but you may find intention or the absence of, of intention upon consideration of their words, their conduct. What did they do out there? Their demeanor, their motive, and other circumstances. So when you look at each defendant separately, because that's what you're going to do, you're going to get three separate verdict forms. When you look at Mr. Bryan, what were his words? What was his conduct? What's his motive? What were the circumstances there for Mr. Bryan? What were they for Greg and Michael? What were they for Travis and Michael? Then what was that tip right, so about how? We're going to talk about the charges in the indictment. All right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a suggestion to you. Yes, too. may help you. Start at the bottom of the indictment. All right? In your deliberations, start with criminal attempt and false imprisonment. It's just easier. You just work through that one, work your way on up, then to felony murder, then to malice murder. It's just, it's a suggestion. So what have we got? Criminal attempt, commit a felony, which is false imprisonment. What's well, an attempt? That's when you perform an act which constitutes a substantial step toward the commission of said crime. Mr. Bryan pulled out of his driveway and ran him into a ditch. Mr. Arbery was able to keep running. Right there, criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment. Criminal attempt to commit, a false, to commit false imprisonment. This is actually what it says in the indictment. What do you have? In violation of the personal liberty of Mr. Arbery. Okay, guess what? We're citizens of the United States, right? We live here. We have personal liberty, because this is a free country. Other people can't go up and stop us, and hold us, and detain us, okay? They have to actually have seen us commit that crime in order to effectuate a citizen's arrest. So you go around and you start stopping people, you're doing that in violation of their personal liberty. And what did they do? They unlawfully chased Ahmaud Arbery through the public streets of Priscilla Shore in pickup trucks and did attempt to detain and confine him without legal authority on Burford using an F-150 pickup truck and a Chevy Silverado pickup truck. We all know that's what they did. False imprisonment. Now this is over on Holmes. In violation of the personal liberty of Ahmaud Arbery, did unlawfully confine and detain Ahmaud Arbery without legal authority. Once again, did not see him commit any crime, not a citizen's arrest. They are not law enforcement officers. They are not in a marked patrol car. They are not with badges on their arms. They're not in a uniform <laughs> without legal jail. authority. He was going to jail, boy. Said accused of shooting him up in jail. Now I better make it back to the hotel. And it's hit Chevy Silverado. He's not going to get not get none of his goddamn motherfuckers. And did confine and detain him on home. These two may be good. When them motherfuckers break into stuff. Travis McMichael said he was pinned between the two trucks. Greg McMichael said he was cracked like a rat between the two trucks. The ultimate false imprisonment. He never left home, did he? Never left home. Aggravated assault. He made an assault upon the person of Ahmaud Arbery with a Ford 150 pickup truck and a Chevy Silverado pickup truck. I got a legal note here for you. Okay, you notice how it says and. Okay, but what do we know? Mr. Bryan is driving the Silverado. Travis is driving the Ford F-150. Greg McMichael is in the passenger seat at first. Then he's in the back of the truck. So, of course, it doesn't mean and. It's or. Okay, I know that sounds crazy. Don't you love lawyers? Don't you love lawyers? Okay. And means or. So the way you should read this is with a Ford F-150 pickup truck or a Chevy Silverado pickup truck. Okay. So, what are pickup trucks? They are objects when used offensively against someone can result in serious bodily injury or death. You hit somebody with a F-150 pickup truck intentionally? You hit them with a Silverado intentionally? Are you going to hurt them? Break a leg? Paralyze them? You can even kill them. We all know that. Hit and run, right? You ain't going homicide. We all know this. And the medical examiner told you so. Actual injury to Ahmad need not 
be shown for aggravated assault with a pickup truck. The judge is going to instruct you. You don't have to actually hit the person. You don't actually have to injure them for it to be aggravated assault. What you have to do is place that person in reasonable fear of receiving a violent injury. This is really important, ladies and gentlemen. Did the defendant commit acts with their pickup trucks that placed Ahmaud Arbery in reasonable fear of receiving serious bodily injury? <clears throat> yeah. Did they do it? We know what Jabayan did. He ran him into a ditch, then tried to go at him again, then went out another time, then backed up toward him. Yeah. What did Travis Kentucky do on the stand? He said, Oh, I just pulled up next to him. No, I didn't startle him. No, he wasn't afraid of me. Do you believe any of that stuff? Just look at the Night Owl video. Look at how Mr. Arbery tries to get away from them, and then look at them speed off after him. All you have to do is look at that Night Owl video, and you'll know that they put him in reasonable fear of receiving bodily harm, violent injury, aggravated assault with a pickup truck. Aggravated assault in count six. Did they assault upon a person of Ahmaud Arbery with a firearm, a deadly weapon, that 12-gauge pump shotgun with seven already in it? <clears throat> Two steps, pull the trigger. That's all you gotta do. The evidence is that the defendants attempted to cause a violent injury to the alleged victim by shooting him. Yeah, that's aggravated assault with a shotgun. Now, I want to be really clear, okay? Travis McMichael does this with the shotgun. We see it on the video. This is the beginning of the aggravated assault. Beginning of the aggravated assault. The aggravated assault continues as he steps away from his car door and blocks the road. Now, what did he say to you? Oh, it's putting distance between me and Mr. Arbery. Was he putting distance or was he blocking the road? You decide. Then what does he do? He doesn't stay right there, does he? We can't see this, but what do we know? He makes it around that car door, right? He makes it over here, right? He's in front of his truck and he's moving forward, closing the distance on Mr. Arbery, intercepting Mr. Arbery, and is right here with that shotgun. It wasn't at court arms like this. It was right like this. And how fast does Mr. Arbery come around the corner and boom, shoots him. That is one continuous aggravated assault ending in the shotgun blast to his torso, right here. He you know, right there. Right? So how was he when the shotgun hit him? Like this. Right? Got it across the wrist, got it right in the torso, came out right here. So he's turned like this, according to the medical examiner. Felony murder. Felony murder is when you commit a felony, and someone dies because of the felony. Classic felony murder scenario. Guy goes into a convenience store to rob the convenience store. He's not there to murder anybody. He's not there to kill the clerk. He doesn't know the clerk. He's somebody he's got, got a gun. gun. Right? So what does he do? Pulls out the gun and is pointing it at the clerk. And the clerk's like, uh, 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 uh. and what does the clerk do? The clerk goes and tries to hit the gun away and starts punching at the armed robber, right? And then what does the armed robber do? Boom! Kills the clerk. Was committing a felony, you cannot claim self-defense. No, you cannot. Now murder the clerk because during the felony that you were doing, you pointed a uh, you were doing armed robbery, you're pointing a gun at somebody. You expect when you're committing mm -hmm. felonies, people are gonna fight back, right? Mm -hmm. The community sir clerk's entitled to fight back, right? Imagine if armed robbers could come in and go, Well, I had to defend myself against the victim of my crime. Right. Did you imagine that was the law? Right? I mean, but isn't that what they're saying? Yeah, it is. How dare Mr. Arbery to. defend himself against their four felonies? Isn't that what they're saying here? So felony murder, let's take a look at it. What is felony murder? For felony murder, the state must prove that the defendant you caused the death of another check by committing a felony. Do not have to show malice, okay? Meaning <laughs> intent to commit the death of somebody. Do not need to show he intended the death with the felony. What we have to show is this. That the felony directly caused the death 
He pulled the trigger on the shotgun. Aggravated assault with a shotgun, yeah, immediately caused the death, right? That's a no-brainer. But what about the other three? You're sitting there thinking, okay, Linda, what about the other three? What are we really talking about here? Did the other three felonies, aggravated assault with a pickup truck, false imprisonment, criminal attempted false imprisonment, did they play a substantial and necessary part in causing the death? The state's position is, yes, they did. In other words, but for this felony being committed, the death would not have occurred. It's really easy. But for the felony being committed, the death would not have occurred. All right, so when does this really apply? The defendants are in the process of committing a series of felonies. They're doing it together at the same time. The defendant shoot Mr. Arbery during the commission of the felony. Did that felony committed against Mr. Arbery ultimately contribute and lead to his death? So how do we look at this? Aggravated assault with a shotgun? Yes. Pointing that shotgun at him, having him run away around the side of the car, Travis McMichael intercepting him with the shotgun and then shooting him? Definitely. Aggravated assault. Felony murder. Aggravated assault with pickup trucks. Well, once again, what do we have? Would he be dead if he hadn't been pinned between these two pickup trucks? Think about this. If he made it up home and over on Zellwood, he'd have run out, right? If he hadn't been pinned between the two pickup trucks on Holmes, but Mr. Bryan running him towards him the white pickup truck, would he still be alive? Yeah. You said their names are who? Their use of the pickup truck mm. to go ahead and commit aggravated assault on him, put him in fear of them and their pickup trucks meant he was running away from them. He saw it, running away. Did their actions, were they such that they put him in reasonable fear of receiving bodily injury? And did that contribute to him ending up where he ended up and his death? Yes, it did. Felony murder. False imprisonment on Holmes. That's what we're talking about. Did they falsely imprison him on Holmes? We've already gone over it. Had him pinned on Holmes, wrapped like a rat between the two pickup trucks, according to Greg McMichael, he's still, after five minutes, running away from them. If they hadn't done this, if they hadn't done this on Holmes, would he be alive? Ask yourselves that. If the answer is yes, felony murder. Check it off. Criminal attempt at false imprisonment. You're thinking, well, Linda, I mean, seriously, okay, that was a wrong burper. I mean, yeah, they pulled up to him. Hey, stop, I want to talk to you. He runs away. They pull forward. They go down to the end of Burford. He then runs away from them again. They're trying to falsely imprison him over there. Did that contribute to it? Yes. Because that's when they began their attack. They're using the pickup trucks over on Burford to put him in reasonable apprehension of receiving serious bodily harm, to put him in fear with their actions. What does Mr. Bryan do? Tries to report, not stop, doesn't try, actually runs him into a ditch. Runs him into the ditch. Aggravated assault. So what's Mr. Arbery doing? We know he runs away from them and runs away from them and runs away from them. Because they have tried to falsely imprison him on Burford and they've used these pickup trucks to do it in a manner that's likely to cause him fear. We don't know what was going through his head. Nobody knows. That would be speculation. But you're allowed to look at it and go, were their actions such that it would put a reasonable person in fear of getting hurt? That's what you want to ask yourself. Those are the felonies in the indictment. So malice murder. What's malice murder? Well, cause the death of another person unlawfully and with malice of forethought. Now, malice of forethought is not ill will or hatred. It's not like what we think of. No premeditation is required, okay? Rather, it's the unlawful intention to kill without justification, okay? Well, what's justification? Justification is self-defense. Deliberate intention to kill is one way you see malice murder. I'm deliberately taking your life, I'm killing you. How do we usually think about that? <coughs> you have to get somebody. You want the uh, husband murdered for the insurance money. Uh, you're you're going to go ahead and execute somebody. You're mad at somebody. You're enraged at somebody. You intend to kill them. That's deliberate intention, right? But there's another kind of malice, and that's implied malice. 
You are allowed to consider this when looking at malice. You may also find malice when there does not appear to be significant provocation and the circumstance of a killing shows an abandoned and malignant heart. Don't you love lawyers? What the heck is an abandoned and malignant heart, right? Well, think about that. You just don't care. You just don't care. What you're doing, you want to do what you want to do. And boy, whoever you're doing it to had better be okay with it. I'm going to order you to stop and talk to me. And if you don't, I'm going to pull out a shotgun on you. And hey, you're still going to run away from me? Oh yeah, I'm going to come at you. I'm going to intercept you over here at the corner. How dare you turn on me? Bam! Wow. Malice. Right there. Malice. Remember, Mr. Aubrey had to have engaged in significant provocation. What did he do? What did Mr. Aubrey do? He ran away for five minutes. He ran away from them. He ran away from them for five minutes. That's what he did. With his hands out of his sides and those baggy shorts he had on. No weapon, no threats. No stolen no property. Help help didn't even now nothing. Help. Ran away from him for five minutes. Chased him down like a dog. State doesn't have to prove what kind of bullshit is State this. State does not have to prove motive. Okay? Not required to explain to you why they did what they did. You know what they did. Some of you may know why they did it. But the state does not have to prove exactly why they did what they did. The indictment. So here's the thing, party to a crime. How in the world could defendant Brian be held responsible if he was in the Silverado filming all this, right? How can Greg McMichael be held responsible if he's in the back of the truck, finally on the phone with 911? They all willingly participated and no one called the police. Well, it's called <coughs> party to a crime. <laughs> That's what it's called. So what's party to a crime? Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you this. Do you think that everyone involved, from the person who actually commits the crime, to someone who encourages or enlists someone to commit the crime, to someone who helps commit the crime, should be held responsible under the law in Georgia? Do you think that, 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 that sounds reasonable? Well, guess what? The law does. The law says everybody involved is guilty. Okay? The person is a party to a crime only if that person directly commits the offense. Driving the trucks. Pulling out that shotgun. Attempting to falsely imprison. Helping to trap somebody by pinning them between two pickup trucks. Running someone towards a man with a shotgun. All directly committing or helping in the commission of the crime or advises and encourages. Well, what's advising and encouraging? 